my older brother got involved with local triad. I got into a fight, and then I got, basically, my brother called the triad to come down. They came over to me, and they said, hey, we're coming to watch over this altercation you're about to have to make sure nothing gets out of hand. After I fought this guy, they came up, came up to me and said, listen, you know, your brother's with our group. This is who we are and we want you to join. And as I'm leaving the door from my house, my mom's standing there and she's, she's crying, you know, because she, she knows I'm going back to do something. She said to me, she said, son, I prayed a prayer I never prayed before in my life. So I prayed to God that he would do whatever it takes to get you to him. This guy is so angry and everyone keeps quiet around him and he pulls out this machete, okay, that he had in his pants. And he's about to start swinging this machete and something that came to my mind was what my mother told me when I was a kid. And she said, son, if you ever get in a situation that you have a problem, I want you to use the name Jesus. And I remember taking one step back and I said, Jesus save me. So Toby, we are super excited to have you here with us at Delphi Testimonies. For the people who may not know you, can you just introduce yourself really quick? Yeah, my name is Jeremy Seow, but I go by Toby. And Choby, could you tell us a little bit about your life before Jesus, kind of starting with your childhood and how that was like for you? Yeah, so childhood, I guess background is my my parents, you know, they, they, they're involved in the church. My dad, though, he's um, Singapore Chinese and first generation Christian. My mom is 100% Polish, but American from Pittsburgh. And also she was a first generation Christian. Um, growing up, it was kind of a rocky household, to be honest with you. Uh, my, my relationship with my father was, was um, not the best. Um, in Chinese culture, you know, especially my generation, we didn't have a very deep connection with our father. It wasn't a very relational, nurturing kind of atmosphere. It was more like kind of roles and um, what you're expected to do. So I never felt like I, I had that, that, that safe spot with my dad. And he also had a, a pretty, uh, he had an anger problem. Probably, honestly, he's probably the violent, most violent person I knew growing up that kind of took away a sense of safety in the household. And then on top of that, I also had a learning disability. I, I, I really couldn't read, I couldn't write, couldn't do math, so I was, I was dyslexic. And on top of that, I also had a, like a speech impediment. So uh, I, I had a really hard time communicating. And because it wasn't communication with my father too, as an example, I wasn't really taught to ask questions or practice communication in the house. Earliest memories, I remember being in school Pretty early on, they put me in special ed class. So I was, I was in public school and I was probably maybe seven or eight. And in my class, there was, there was three of us in the public school, okay? There was a, a girl who, she was, she was like, she was deaf. And there was a dude that, he was blind. And there was me. I mean, because they just didn't know what to do with me. They just knew this guy had some learning issues and they got, he got me away from everybody else. And I remember like having my first report card that I could recall and bringing that report card back to the car when my dad's picking me up. And when he pulled this report card out, there was like literally a bunch of like, just bad, just bad grades basically. And I remember he told me when he drops me back home and he comes back home that night to be waiting for him. And I knew what that meant. I knew that he was gonna, he was gonna beat me, you know? And to be honest, it was quite common to get beat for like, for all kinds of reasons. And he left after dropping me off at the house. And I remember going to my room and just having such high anxiety and fear that he was gonna come back and just whoop me. And I remember putting books in my pants because I was like, I know he's gonna, he's gonna come down hard. And when he got back home that night, he came to my room and he knew I put pants, he put, I put books in the back of my pants, you know? So he made me take everything off and he just beat me so hard. And I remember that night my mom said, okay, tomorrow you're not going to school because I was all black and blue. And in my mind, I, it was very hard for me to understand because I, I, I had high effort in school but I just couldn't understand what was going on. I couldn't, I didn't know why academics didn't click. You know, I remember thinking about education and it was quite, it brought anxiety to me because I opened up a book and I don't know what it's saying. I can't, I don't know what's making out, you know? So when I was about 11, 12, my family moved to New Zealand. It was a, a total new environment, new culture, new weather, you know, people's accents were different. So I'm going through this culture shock about 11 years old. And we moved to a place called Mangadei in Auckland. And Mangadei in Auckland was kind of the hood. And so we, I go to this public school. It's my first week there. I'm already going through kind of this culture shock. And I remember going to my class the first day. I was a little bit late. And the, and the teacher introduced me as, as a new kid, you know. And right away, I just heard these racial slurs, you know, because I was Asian. And there wasn't many Asians 
at that time in my school. And I just felt so unprotected and vulnerable because I'm going through all this stuff, my family life back home. I feel vulnerable with my dad. I already know that I'm, I can't, I can't, I, I have a problem learning. And, and now I'm just getting like attacked, you know? So there's this group there in my school. They started kind of getting, they would give verbal abuse and then physical abuse to me and my younger brother. So I started to fight because I said, you know what? I just can't have this no more. So they're beating my younger brother. And that's how I got involved with my first gang. So Toby, during all of this that was going on, the difficulties at home and even in school, where was God? Did you have any concept of who mm. God was? I know you said you were raised in a Christian household. What was, you know, the impression of Jesus um, in your life? I mean, I always believed that God was real, but because of what I was going through, I, I just I just never knew he was personal. I always thought he was distant, maybe because I was very distant from my father. It was very hard for me to conceive a love of God. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I believe that he was real, but I didn't believe he was personal. That he was kind of doing his thing and I was doing my thing, you know? So... Yeah. So, Toby, tell us about this gang, like these lifestyles that you kind of found yourself getting into because of mm -hmm. the bullying and, you know, the racial um, things that were going on. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what I saw right away is, I, I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't involved in getting right away. But when I started to fight, I saw that and it, it came naturally to, for me because I saw my father, he, he would deal with situations with his fist, mm -hmm. not talking. So for me, because plus I had a speech impediment growing up, I was quite insecure to talk. So like. When, I, when they started um, coming up to my brother, I thought, I'm just going to start protecting him and not letting this happen. And when, that, when I started to be physical with these people, then I saw they started back, backing off and they started to keep quiet. And there, was, there were games that were quite prevalent in Mangare, Auckland. Like, all, like, my, like the kids in my school, they talk about their, their, their dads and uncles being black power and Mangro mob and all this stuff like that. They were local, you know? And so actually me and the guys that I started fighting with, we became friends and we started making our own crew. And that was 11 years old. So we called ourselves the SBs, you know. And we were only there for about a year and a half. Then we went from there to Malaysia. And in Malaysia, it was quite more familiar because it's an Asian country. It's very close to Singapore. We have the same cultural groups there. We have the Malays, Indians, and the Chinese. And, and, the, and the city I lived in called Penang was more Chinese dominated like Singapore is. So, and I also have roots from Malaysia because I have aunts and uncles that live there too. So when I moved there, my older brother got involved with a local triad. I got into a fight, and then I got, basically, my brother called the triad to come down, and they came over to me, and they said, hey, we're coming to watch over this altercation you're about to have to make sure nothing gets out of hand. After I fought this guy, they came up, came up to me and said, listen, you know, your brother's with our group, this is who we are, and we want you to join. I told him, though, I said, listen, I need like a week to think about it, and maybe come back like in a week, you know? And on Friday, the next week, literally from that day, I, a, a car pulls up when I'm walking back home, and this guy's in there and asked me, you know, you got a week to think about it. What do you want to do? And I said, okay, I'll join. That's how I got involved. So can you kind of explain for those that may not know what a triad is? Kind mm -hmm. of were these usual things, like people coming up to you, like in back cars to recruit people? Like, was this part of the culture? Can you kind of explain just a little bit more about what that was like? Yeah, at first I didn't, I didn't know it was... A triad. I didn't even know what a triad was. All I knew was gangs, right? And and triad is like the Chinese mafia. It's they're very intricate and they're quite strong, especially in Penang, Malaysia, where I'm from. Like I speak from my from my own experience, you know. They're involved with prostitution, the drug dealing, white collar crime, you know, extortion, things of that level. They start recruitment also quite early. So 13 years old to be recruited when I was recruited was quite normal there. And there's many triad groups. In, in the city I was from. These triad groups, they start recruiting at that age because they want to build up their membership. So they can get in when they're young, they're trainable, and they, they, can, they, can, they can learn what's going on, you know, until they're, until they're older. So yeah, recruitment is pretty prevalent at 13, 14. Yeah. So Toby, could you tell us now, you know, you've committed yourself, I guess, to being in this um, gang. What was that like? Mm -hmm. What did you start to get introduced to? Yeah. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Journey. So in, in, in my mind, when I, when I, when I, when I first got, when I first got involved, um, there was many people in my rank that was recruited in my triad. So I knew everybody in my rank that was part of our subdivision. Okay. So it's very, it's broke down subdivisions or branches. So I knew that school wasn't 
I didn't have a future in school. So at 13 years old, I actually got expelled at middle school. So I never went to high school a day in my life. I missed all my high school. And I realized that if I can be around my leader, who we call Tai Lo in Chinese, Chinese tribe, our boss called Tai Lo or Big Brother, and the people under us we call Gina, you know. So I was the Gina of my Tai Lo, and I, I knew that if I was around my boss and I was around my leaders, my elders, I can watch them, I can keep quiet, and, and, and hopefully I can, I can gain their favor. Because if I gain their favor, then I have opportunity inside the triad. And because I was kicked out of school, my boss, my Tai Lo said, hey, Chobi, you know what? You're kicked out of school right now. Why don't you come start hanging around us? And that's exactly what I wanted because I, growing up, translated protection as love because I felt so unprotected in my life, whether home or school, I just felt so unprotected. So when, when my Tai Lo offer protection, they'll say, you know, you, you, join, you join our triad, it's like the recruit, you join our triad, you know, this is what we're involved in. This is the future you have. You know, you go to jail, we're going to bail you out. I mean, they got connections and all that. So it's very enticing to know you're covered like that under this mafia group. Because I was kicked out of school and my, and my boss said, you know what? You're out. A lot of the members your rank are still in school. I'm going to train you up. And, and me and my boss came very, very close. You know, we had, we had a very good relationship. And so he really groomed me in the Chinese triad. Showed me who was who, what to do, what not to do. You know, how to, and then, and then after some time, he said, she'll be, because, you know, you're out of school right now and we're in charge of a few different local schools, um, which are recruiting grounds. And like I said, training grounds too. He said, I'm going to make you my right hand man. So everybody under me is going to come under you now. And so now you got to be in charge of the recruitment process, the well being of all the Gina, which is the, all the kids, and, and making sure, taking care of basically internal affairs and also external affairs that if we have pros of other tribe groups. So very quickly at 15, 16, I already had responsibility. You know, I had people that I had to manage, you know. And at that time, my relationship with my father was also pretty out of hand. And I, I remember one time that, you know, violence was just pretty much my, 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 my activity because that's what you do, you know, in the triad. But also at home, it was also still violent. And I remember one day, I got back home and it was actually my younger brother's birthday and me and my father had, a, had an altercation and I remember that he just started blowing up, you know. He started just, 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 just punching me right in the face, back of the head, got me on the ground, put his knee on my temple. And I remember getting up and I, was, I just started to explode. I took, a, I took a chair and I started to beat my dad with it. I started throwing it out of windows, trying to smash the house up. I remember when, I got, when we got done with that altercation, my father came and he started to apologize to me. And it's the first time I ever heard him really apologize because it just, it, even, a, even culturally, the Chinese culture, Christian or not, it's just, they don't just do that, you know, which is really sad to say. And he started saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I have an anger problem, but I just thought that it's going to go on like normal. Nothing's going to change. But, but actually, from that point onwards, something happened in my father. And he actually started to calm down. And I, I thought, dude, this is so weird. Seeing him all my life blow up and all of a sudden, like, something's changed in him. And in my mind, my father, who was the most terrifying person in my life, for to see him calm down and not react to certain things that he used to, it, it really did something to my mind. And I thought, maybe it's only, only God could have done something like this, you know? And what happening was, was... My parents knew I was involved in the triad. I would tell them, listen, I'm a tribe member for life. This is the way I'm going to live. That's just how it's going to be. But my father, he actually started to kind of reach out to me. And that, that, that on its own was really weird. But he actually started winning my trust. And we actually started to develop a relationship. And then it, it kind of got even to a point that I trusted my father. I also, during this time in my teenage years, I also started to have really, really... Um, bad um, sleep paralysis, but it was, it was to a point that I would actually slip out of my body. So it's almost like the sleep paralysis would take, go to another level. That's almost like my, my soul is coming out of my body and I'm actually looking around at my sleeping body and seeing furniture, but I also see the spirit world. And that part right there really started opening my eyes because it would happen quite a bit. To a point that I, I just realized that there's actually a, a, a supernatural, a different, a spirit world that's that's um, beyond the physical. 
So my eyes started opening up. I, I, I really felt that evil was so strong. And e even in a way that uh, evil need to be respected. Because the gang I was with and a lot of triads, they, they also have a certain deity they worship. And they also have a, uh, a lot of them have temples that are dedicated to the triad. Meaning they have, they have like even monks that are involved with the triad. They're the triad members. And the guys I was with, my, my leader and a, a lot of triad members, they will actually welcome different spirits. And they actually practice witchcraft. You know, they would, they would wear, they would get certain tattoos that the monks would come and they do a hand tattoo and they, they would actually blow spells into them and they're going to trances, but they're welcoming like a monkey god. Of, they're fighting gods. They're fighting spirits, really. And they, they would actually go for fights with machetes and they wouldn't even get cut, even to that extent. So they, 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 they welcome all this kind of, so in my mind, even seeing all that, it gave me kind of a respect but at the same time, I didn't want to, I, I never, even my boss wanted me to get the, 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 the spiritual tattoos. I, I never got them because I knew what I was seeing at night. And I didn't want to like kind of provoke. Does that make sense? I didn't want to provoke because when I was going through these, these almost like an out of body experience when I was asleep, it was very terrifying. It was very, very scary, you know? And so I, I just didn't want to mess with that. Um, Yeah. So, Toby, I know that you had a lot of powerful encounters that mm -hmm. led you to um, Jesus and, and yeah. to salvation. Can you walk us through kind yeah. of how you came from being a, a gang member in, mm -hmm. in these mafias to now serving the Lord? Yeah, so the word, of my, 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 the word of the Lord came to my mom, and the Lord told my mother that I was going to get killed if they stayed in Malaysia. So one day my mom comes and she says, we're packing up, but we're leaving. I had no idea, though, that God spoke to my mom. And if she told me, I probably thought she would be crazy, to be honest, because I, I didn't think God could like speak to you like that. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to try to come to the States because in Chinese, we call America the mountain of gold. <laughs> OK, so we think this place might be an opportunity or something. So we end up leaving. But before I leave, actually at the airport, a lot of the guys from the tribe came to, to send me off. And as I'm saying goodbye to a bunch of these guys, there, there was quite a few of them, maybe, maybe 25, 30 of them. There was one guy who I actually kind of grew up with that he wasn't involved in the gangs, but when I was saying goodbye to him, he said, Chobe, I have something for you. And he, in his hand, he had his little New Testament Bible. And, and he did that in front of everybody. But he had the boldness to hand me this New Testament Bible. And I took it because I, I, you know, me and him were cool, so I took it with me. I brought it back to the States. As I'm back in the States, right, I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna end up going back to Asia. I'll take, I'll stay here. I'll fly back and forth. I had my right hand man running, my, running, you know, my, 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 my kids, my group, all that. As I was here, I really just remember thinking that my girlfriend back in Malaysia was cheating on me. Something just told me she was cheating on me. So I called my, my boss up and I said to him, I said, listen, I got this feeling that this girl's cheating on me. Can you check it out? So the next day I get a phone call and my Tyler, my boss called me. He said, Chobi, we, we looked around. And this is who she's, she's cheating on you. And this is who it is. And I just lost it because that guy who she went with, he was also involved with the tri, the tri groups. And part of our, we call the laws, right? Part of our laws is you cannot, doesn't matter what tribe you're from. You can never take a, a, um, a girl from a tribe member. That's, break, that's breaking our law. We call it our laws, you know? So I thought, and this guy, I, I actually fought him before. And I thought to myself, I don't know what he's doing because he's spiteful or what. I remember calling at that time, now with my ex-girlfriend, and I said, listen, I'm gonna fly back to Penang, and I want you to tell him I got a present for him. And I had a, I had a plan to go, to, to go get this guy. So I bought a plane ticket. I remember thinking this, this point in my life, like my life was almost crumbling, you know, because I, I, I was already a branch leader with people under me, and that was my dream as a kid. I, I always dreamt that if I, I wanna be someone of leadership within the triad. I didn't want, I wanna be an asset, you know? I wanted all this, all that, the name. And I'm thinking to myself, like, it, what's it for? What's the purpose of it, you know? So I started questioning life, you know? And the day I'm leaving to the airport, I actually, gra I actually grabbed that New Testament Bible that my friend gave to me from Penang. And as I'm leaving the door from my house, my mom's standing there and she's, she's crying, you know? Because she, she knows I'm going back to do something. She said to me, she said, son, she said, look at me. And I looked at my mom and she said, I want to tell you something. So I prayed a prayer I never prayed before in my life. So I prayed to God that he would do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get you to him. 
to bring you to, to Christ, you know? In her mind, she thought she would never see me again, but I didn't know that God already told her that I'm, a, I'm that I might get, I'm gonna probably get killed over that. So they moved the whole family to get away from the mafia stuff. But when she told me that, I felt like something was gonna happen on my trip. And so I get to the airplane and I pull out the New Testament Bible because my life, the only comfort I had in my life was control. Controlling people, you know, using violence to control people, whatever. I, I felt like that wasn't my safety because I was so insecure. You know, I felt like life was so insecure. And in the plane, I just felt like the plane's going to crash. You know, I always think, like, I can't control. I'm not flying the plane. So I'm like, I'm freaking out. You know, so I open the New Testament Bible, and I'm still filled with this rage, you know. And here I can't read. I've never read a book in my life. And I'm flipping through these pages, right? And I see these words pop out. And it said, in three days, I will heal you. And I just can't believe what I'm seeing because Mm -hmm. I know that I've never been able to read before. And I'm thinking, honestly, this is like a miracle or something. So I close this and I say, God, if this is you speaking to me right now, in three days, if you take away my anger from this guy who I'm flying halfway around the world to go find, I'm going to let him go. And I thought about that prayer. And I thought about what I saw. In three days, I'll heal you. I get to Penang and my guys are waiting. And I told him, listen, I, I, need, I need a few days. Three days go by. And all I knew was rage and anger. I just didn't have, I didn't know how to control this thing, you know. I wake up in the morning on the third day and I just felt this peace in, in, in this room I woke up at. And I said, man, I, was, I came all the way here to find this guy. And I feel this peace. And peace was such a foreign thing to me. I didn't even understand what peace was. So I let, I let that guy go. But that month, I spent the whole month in that city in Penang. And I went to a club, and we we got we got we got a table, we got bottle service, and it was only me and me and two other guys who were who were, who were same rank as me and in, in my triad. And after a few hours go by, my 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 friend comes and says, "Hey, Cho, our rivals are here," and I'm like, "You know what? We just spent all this money on bottles. Let's just have fun, and then let's just call it peaceful. You know, let's just go home, whatever." So the club closes, and then we go to eat food. You know, like kind of like out outside by the street. The car, this car pulls up where, where we're eating and the arrivals, a different triad is in that car and they come up next to us sitting down and it was automatic. When they sat down, we started fighting right away. You know, we started fighting and um, one of the guys got hurt pretty bad, went back home. The next day, I get a phone call. And at that time, um, our territory was called Gurney Plaza. It was, it was, we have many different areas of territory, but this was a territory that literally me and a few other guys are assignment was to take that territory over and we did that so these guys now who we beat up the night before are there and my right hand man who was at the territory called me to show me these guys who you had a fight with they're here looking for you and i know they're coming to retaliate so i'm on the way and i call my 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 boss to come my boss gets there before i do and he's like on the seventh or eighth floor there's a, there's like a there's like a pool center up there and he tells me Chobi, when you come you come, up, come upstairs and you tell me what happened last night because now I got to report to the boss. Once he's called, now he is in charge of the situation. Because the tribes are very political and they different groups work with each other, he was, he was going to go confront that leader that, that, that came to that area. So he's upstairs waiting for me and my two friends. So I, we got together the same guys I was with the night before and I'm on the first floor, okay? And it was almost like just day-to-day triad stuff. I push the elevator button and I see the elevator come down. I'm walking the elevator like five, four, three, two, one. And be- before that happens though, like I see there's guys behind me in the first floor too. And I don't know who they are. And um, when the elevator opens, I see a bunch of dudes in there. And I'm like, I know this is the, this is the gang. And they start coming out. A lot of them don't know who I am. And I don't know a lot of who they are. But in my mind, I suspect that they're the rivals. And one of the last guys that come out, and as they're exiting out, we kind of walk in the elevator. The, I see a guy with his face, and he's really messed up. And I knew he was, in, he was a guy from the night before. So he turns around, and now we're in the elevator. And they're talking to other guys on the first floor, and now they start assembling around this elevator. And they're rolling in numbers here. And they're very upset. And I'm thinking, we might just have to fight right here. And I know, I know we're completely outnumbered. But all of a sudden, I just can feel that 
there was a spirit of death that was there. It was so strong that for some reason I, I felt like I, I'm I'm gonna I'm going to die today, and this that I'm, I'm gonna be taken. I just and I could not get out of my mind, and I'm facing this triad, and I'm trying to ignore what I'm feeling because this is like a really weird thing that's going on in my head. Like I'm feeling this spirit of death. That's the only way I put it. And the leader starts talking in front of me and he is shouting, and this guy is so angry. And everyone keeps quiet around him and he pulls out this machete, okay, that he had in his pants. And it's in the middle of, of, of his mall, okay? He pulls out the machete and he's, and he's saying to us, you know, why did you attack our guys? We're coming here to settle problems right now. And he's trying to, he's actually trying to get us to kidnap us first, but we're not trying to go anywhere. And he's about to start swinging this machete and something that came to my mind was what my mother told me when I was a kid. And she said, son, if you ever get in a situation that you have a problem, I want you to use the name Jesus. Because I will always say to my mom, you know, I'm, you know, this is, you know, our, our tribe is powerful. This is our name, this and that. It's all about like us, you know. But that, what she told me came to my mind. And I remember taking one step back and I said, Jesus saved me. And in that moment, with this guy about to swing this machete, I see a hand come in the crowd, okay? Because they're, 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 they're assembled, you know? And held this guy back. And I look, and as one of my triad members that was actually looking for us, he came just like that. And he actually knew the guy with the machete. And he said, hey, hey, you know, um, use his name and all that. These are my guys, whatever. And we broke up. And I thought to myself, it was just the nick of time. And I thought, and it was the name Jesus. And then the next day, I'm thinking about what's going on, but I go to another club and they're passing out pills. So I'm taking these pills and I'm just overdosing. My friends are bringing me outside because I can't really feel my body. I'm, I'm really dying, honestly. And I, I remember looking to the sky. I remember the day before and I said, Jesus, save me, Lord. And I sobered up. Com I completely got back on my feet. I was completely sober. And my guys are looking at me like, Shobi, are you okay? And I said, I... I think Jesus saved me, and they're thinking, man, Joby lost it. But I, something happened in my heart. And then the third day, my right-hand man came to pick me up in his car. And as he pulls up, I, I heard this voice, and it said, put your seatbelt on. And I never wore my seatbelt over there. It's not like America where you, everything's like super strict laws. It's like, you do what you want over there, you know. I never put my seatbelt on. But I got in the car, because I heard that voice, I put my seatbelt on. And I look to my friend, and my friend is actually, he's actually making fun of me. He's like, Shobi, you know, I never, you never put your belt on. Why, you don't trust my driving? I said, no, you put yours on too. And he put his on. And in Asia, they drive up this side, on the right side. America's left, but he was driving on this side. So we're going down the street, and he's flying with this car. And there was a car that braked all of a sudden in front of him. And I remember just hearing the wheels like hit the, hit, you know, the, the hearing the wheels squeak. And I thought, no matter what we hit right now, I know it's gonna be it. We're going way too fast. And my life literally flashed before my eyes. I don't know why that happens, but I don't know if it's because you're, you're just like, it's part of like, just seeing all you went through, what all your decisions you made. But I remember thinking 11 years old up to now, the person I was, and I thought there's nothing good in my life. And I said, I, I, I thought, I know I'm going to hell. Mm. I just closed my eyes and I felt this massive bump and I just knew that this is going to be it, you know? I, f I felt this huge crash and I felt like it's like suspended in air. You know how your stomach kind of goes up? You feel like your stomach is like dropping or something? I felt this and I remember opening my eyes and like there was this leaves all in this windshield and my head was tilted sideways because there's this huge pole that went through the windshield and my head was like this and and the pole actually went all the way back to the back windshield and i'm turning over to my friend here and he's going through the seizure and his eyes are rolled back and i never it was my first time i saw a seizure his eyes were rolled back and he just had blood streaming down his head going all over his shirt my body was so in shock i could almost i could almost not even feel my body because of the impact you know so i didn't even know if like if i was alive or dead i wasn't sure but i popped my seatbelt off and I fall on this, fall on the floor, and I get off the ground to see what we hit. Because at that time, I was in a daze. And I didn't know what we hit. When I look at the car, what happened was when the car was going down the street and it fishtailed, it actually jumped off the sidewalk 
and the car went so high in the air, it landed in this tree. And this tree was like a Y, and it was sitting like that, perfectly. It was completely suspended in this tree with two branches, you know? And the front of the car hit this, like, this kind of village, like, 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 roof thing, and that pole was part of that structure, you know? And these people came out, they got, they got my friend down, and he's in my arms, and he's just, like, bleeding everywhere. He's telling me, Chobi, I can't, I can't feel from my waist down, and he's kind of going in and out of consciousness. I remember thinking, man, there's just death all around me, you know, in my life, you know, and he was saying to me, tell my, tell my parents, I love, he's, he's basically giving me his last words, you know, and at that time, all I could do was just call on God, and I just started praying for him, ambulance came, and we went to the hospital to get x-rayed and all this. At that time, when I was thinking about the Bible, what I read in three days, and I, I and the I, I, God saved me from the machete thing, the overdose, and this car accident, as I'm laying in bed, and I'm thinking about the name Jesus and how I called on him, even though I was so far from God. And even though at that point, I was the most evil person that I've, I've, I knew. I knew my, dark, my heart was so dark. But I saw how a situation that was beyond human control, now God intervened in a way that completely shattered everything I believed about him. And the biggest person in my life was my Thilo, my boss. I remember laying in bed and just saying, God, I want you to be my Thilo now. Because I knew that, that it, was a, it, it was his intervention that saved me completely. And in the hospital, when I, when I said that, that was like my, my prayer to God, you know? I felt something come alive inside of me. And I actually, it's almost like, um, almost like having breath for the first time and really know you're breathing, but it was inside my, my, like my being, you know? And I was in the hospital for maybe like two nights, came out with scratches, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm gonna surrender my life to the Lord because of what he did, you know? So I go back to the States and I just know that God saved me in, in a way that I would have been done for if he didn't. And I know that, that I can't read, but his word is like what he wants for my life. So I remember going to my room and just saying to God, God, I know you have power. I seen what you did. I, I need you to help me to read because I know your plan for me is in here. And if I'm gonna follow you, I, I need to know what it's saying. And I opened that New Testament Bible. And as I'm going through the lines, the words started making sense to me. And, and here I was, you know, I'm, I'm never went to high school a day in my life. I mean, I said I had special head teachers, you know, like one-on-one -on -one stuff. They couldn't. And here I am, like, I started to read the Bible. I started to see that what his, his word, his truth, like, I started realizing my life, the way I was living was wrong because now I'm seeing what he wants from me. That lying's wrong, you know, <laughs> sleeping with girl, all these stuff. I was so hungry for the word that I read the New Testament seven times in six months. And in that time, as I was spending time with the Lord, he spoke to me one day. I heard, I heard him say, I want you to go back and I want you to quit the mafia. I want you to talk to your boss and I want you to talk to all of your guys. And that was such a struggle for me. First, I was like, that can't be God, you know? I'm like questioning this thing. But every time I pray, I felt very strongly. He was saying, go back. And yeah, so I bought, it, I bought a plane ticket and that was my plan. So, Toby, during these six or seven months that you're reading this Bible, you're learning God's will for your life, you're finding yourself in this, like, repented lifestyle, what were your family saying? You know, they had sent you off thinking that you were going to die, mm -hmm. and now you come back renewed. What was your mom's reaction, your dad? Like, what were people around you thinking? At first, they didn't believe me at very first because I was such a crazy person. They thought, oh, he's just talking. But when they saw me, I, I wouldn't come out of my—I wouldn't come out— of my house, and I had friends in the States too. When they knew I was back, they'd come to my door and I, I would just not even go out. When they saw that, and they saw me start writing down scripture, and I started posting it on my door. So when I wake up, I would just look right on my wall, scripture. You know, they started seeing all this. They thought, wow, this guy, Joby, God really did something. And they were so ecstatic. And they can see that things that I was embracing, I started saying, you know what? I don't want that for my life anymore. I started giving stuff up, you know what I mean? And that right there, I think they started seeing, okay, like, I, you know, Chobi's really, you know, he really met the Lord. And um, it, it was, it was uh, definitely different for them. But of course, their prayers are being answered. And my mom's prayer specifically was being answered because she knew I had a, 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 you know, a crazy encounter. 
you know, with, with the Lord and all that. And what were their reactions to you wanting to go back to Asia and, you know, renounce kind of this group that you were a part of? Yeah, they didn't want me to do it. Can you tell us a little bit more about, like, how you made the decision to go even when you were wrestling with God, you were mm-hmm. hearing the disapproval, you know, of your parents? Yeah. What made you continue? Because I knew that a lot of guys were tribe members because I recruited them. I was responsible for a lot of these guys here. And I felt that responsibility. I knew that just by spending time with God, he wanted me to go back. So I decided to go back. I knew if I go back and I told my guys that I quit, that I I, I needed to face my boss and I needed to do it a tr- like the, tr- the traditional style you're going to come out. Not just like say, hey, man, I'm laying low, whatever. It's like, I got to go face my boss and do this like officially. So when I went back to Penang, I had dinner with my, with my Thai Lo, you know, and he was with a bunch of other elders and I didn't know he was coming with them, but he brought me out to eat and he was so happy to see me. Like I said, we, had, we actually had a good relationship. And after we got done eating, he was gonna drop me off at this apartment I was gonna stay at, in my friend's place. And I told him, I said, there's something I have to give to you. And I said, can you, can you, can you please come outside of the car with me, you know? In Chinese culture, we have to get on our knees and we have to get a, give a red envelope of Chinese right here, we call it ang pao. And that's like your, and you gotta give two hands on your, on the uh, kind of like bowing down, you know? That's like the first step. And then whatever the boss decides to do with you is up to him. When he came out of the car, I tell you, I was, I was, I was so freaked out. I was, I was, I was, I was very freaked out. And I remember just telling God that, Lord, when I get on my knees, I want you to know that I'm, I'm bowing down before you coming out of this. And when I got on my knees, I, 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 I handed him the envelope and I felt, I really felt at that time when my knees dropped, just God's peace just come and overwhelm me. And I just felt his presence, you know? My leader picked me up and he asked me, you know, what's going on here? And I told him, I said, listen, this is what God did in my life, you know? And he knew I wasn't educated. He knew, he knew all of that. He knew my education was on the street, you know? And he said to me, you know, why don't you just retire? And that's a title that we have. Retire means like you, you've done your work. You're still respected. You're still a member, but you don't got to do nothing anymore. You're done. I said, I said, I, I can't. I said, I, God told me to come back here. And I told God, he's my, he is my Thilo now. And I got to tell the other guys I'm out. So he took the envelope. He took the money out. Cause we got to put a certain, a certain number inside that envelope, which represented our triad. He said, you take the money, Chobe, this envelope, you're out. And then, and, and then he called the office. Cause we, oh, when you join the triad, your name is registered. In the, we have an office, you know. He said, he called the office. He said, your file's done. You're officially out. And I remember just feeling the weight completely lifted from that day. Completely lifted. And the next day, I went to, my territor- to our territory and I called my right-hand man up. I said, listen, call the whole group out. I want to have a meeting right now. No one can, no, everyone must be here. No exception, you know. So he got everyone to come out and they're all, they're all, around, you know, and I started telling them, I said, Jesus came into my life and I met with the big boss yesterday. I'm out. I'm telling all you guys, you know, I apologize for getting you involved. I apologize for who I've been to you, but now I'm going to follow the Lord. I quit in front of, you know, I, I, I told them everything that I'm done. Could you actually tell me just a little bit, how did your members kind of take that? Were they angry with you? Were they sad? Like, or... What was their response? Yeah, they, they had different responses, you know. Some were, some were in shock because, you know, in the triad, your Thilo is everything to you. You do everything they say, you know. And, and honestly, if, you know, with these guys here, they, they, they followed me. Some of them were actually in disbelief, you know. Like, Chobi, like of all people, is coming out. Yeah, some were a little confused because they thought when I come for the, for the, the meeting, like, we're going to get everything back in order and... We're going to party and all this stuff. But they said, man, this guy just became a Christian, you know? So take us through, you know, now the Lord has pulled you out. He's kind of healed you. He's even shown you mercy with your Mm -hmm. gang leader Mm -hmm. to allow you to just leave so easily. And then you get back to the States. What does the Lord begin to do for you then? Where does he begin to take you? And what does your life begin to look like? I knew that I, I had a lack of foundation in the Lord. And I knew that there was a lot of things that God had sorted out in my life. I, de- I first decided to do a DTS, which is a discipleship training school with YOM. It's a six month training program. I thought I really got to get foundation in the Lord, you know? I felt like it was a great opportunity to do it. I joined YOM for six months and ended up going on a staff for a couple of years. 
And then during that time, the Lord spoke to me about going back and getting re-educated. Because here I was still kicked out of middle school. I had no education. I, you know, here in the U.S., I do a GED, which is a basically a high school equivalent. I remember, like, opening up my books, my GED books, to study everything I missed in high school. And I remember even facing that, it was almost facing a place of, of trauma, in a way, because education resembled a place of hurt for me and a place of kind of shame. But it was also a time of he- a healing process, because I felt like the, like God was, was, was helping me through it. And in 10 months, I got the GED, and I went to college, you know. And actually, what happened was, even in college, in writing, I remember my, my writing class, okay, my professor would come up a couple of times, and he would say, do you mind if I, if I would read your, your essays and all this to the class? And I would say, yeah, go for it. I remember sitting in class, and he would be reading my papers, and he would just be so, imp- and I just thought to myself, if he knew what I went through, missing all of, you know, being special ed, dyslexic, and God, you know, I was on the dean's list, you know, God just really helped me, even in education. And then from there was business. I went, you know, three different stores. And then from there, that was seven years, and went on to doing more missions, and then now involve other stuff in the business world, you know, but, um, I just seen God redeem every part of my life. And even my name, Chobi, you know, that name, when I first came to know the Lord, I asked God, God, do you want me to be called, you know, something else, like Jeremy or something else? Because my name, Chobi, was, 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 you know, it had a reputation for itself. I fasted and I prayed. I didn't tell anybody about this. And I prayed for two weeks. And one day I stepped in my church and my pastor walks up to me in the middle of service. And he said, Chob, I got something to tell you. I said, I said, what? He said, God woke me up last night, and he doesn't know about my, me praying, Kay. He said, God woke me up last night and told me what your name meant. And he hands me this piece of paper, and I'm looking at this piece of, piece of paper in church, and it says, C-H-O-B-Y, Christ heals over bad years. Mm-hmm. And I remember just tears just coming down, knowing that he, God, redeems even the name, you know. And I have seen God redeem every part of my life. So many miracles with PTSD, violence that I could not control. I'm talking like it was just, I I thought, how could I ever live without being like fanatical? Because you you, you live as your lifestyle, you know? And God breaking that. God helped me sleep at night. You know, the sleep paralysis part going away, you know, and encountering him in that way. And so like, I seen him redeem all these things throughout the years. So, Chobi, I know that now you're kind of involved in going on missions and going overseas to even spread the gospel. Can you tell us just a little bit about how the Lord began to even touch your heart to take you from a place where, you know, you were overseas involved in all these other activities, but now he's taking you back overseas, but for him now? Yeah, I I know where I was at. And I, I, I know that without him, I felt like there was just no, there was, there life was pointless and there, there, it was meaningless, you know? And I just felt like, you know, Jesus, Jesus, he is the reason why we are here. And so I, 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 have, the, I have this conviction. I've always had this conviction since I gave my life to the Lord about sharing with others about who he is, what he can do, how personal he is. Because of that, I, I, I feel a strong impression in my heart to continue to share about who he is, the gospel, his grace, his love, his forgiveness, and his redemption and healing. Chobi, do you have any words of encouragement for people who may be struggling with some sort of learning disability and it may be causing insecurity or shame and even people who may be in Christ dealing with these things? Do you have any words uh, for them? Mm. Just that God, God, God is a God of healing and there's nothing impossible for him. There's nothing too big that he, can, he cannot heal. My encouragement is, is that God, he's able to renew and restore every part of life, even if it's a, you know, a mental struggle or a learning disability that God has a plan and that he has value and that shame is not his plan for you. And he has really new life all the way around, including in if you're struggling with, with mental disability or learning disability, that God is able to do all things. 
We know that the internet is very large and this video may reach people who are involved right now in organized crime. Do you mm -hmm. have any words of advice or encouragement for those people watching? I'll say the same thing. I know it's not easy to get out, especially when it comes to lifestyle and identity. But I will, I will say this. I will say to if you get in a situation with that life, you're always in situations, but you call on that name Jesus. It is the most powerful name. It is the most, he is, he's able to take a situation and take control beyond what you can do. And so, so my encouragement is to reach out to the Lord in your situation, in your, in your encounters that you have, that you may, you feel like you cannot get out of, or you need, you need God to intervene. You call on Jesus and he, he is real and he is able to show up beyond what you can imagine or what your capability of doing. And Chobi, do you have any advice for somebody who may want to share the gospel, but they don't feel like they have the freedom to do so because of, you know, not being smart enough, not being educated enough on it, or, you know, just feeling like they're not worthy to share the gospel? Do you have any advice for people going through that? Yes, it's, it's only by grace. It's all by grace, you know. When He calls us, all of us who are, who are in Him, we're all saved by grace. We all fall short of the glory of God, you know, but it is, it is Him who will do the work. It may just be a, it may be something very very simple, sharing the gospel about you know maybe it's laying seeds here and there. Yeah, if God if God can use me, God can use anybody really, you know. So and, and know and know that what you carry transforms people. What you carry transforms communities and can transform nations. So the power of the gospel is 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 really like Paul said for for, for salvation. Um, it's the power of salvation. So never feel like incapable or maybe you might say, I don't have a, a story like Chobi, but, but you know, I don't, I don't have all that kind of rough background. But the truth is, Jesus too, he was innocent, right? But he, cha he changed the world. So you don't need this story or that story. You know, you may just be, you might feel like, man, I'm, I'm just sheltered. That's okay. You can, you, you can still rock the nations, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, because we, we, have, we have the same Holy Spirit that can do all things. So yeah, be encouraged. Chobi, who is Jesus to you? To me, he's not only the one that heals, he is, he is healing. He's not only the one that shows love, he is love. And he is, he, he really came in the flesh and became, and is, my, is our best friend, is my best friend. And he's the one that gave me a whole new life. So he is definitely my God, my savior, and he's everything, my breath. Do you have any last words for the people that are watching? Yeah, just go, go to the Lord. And a ask him, you know, you might, this might be completely new to you. It might sound so wild that you're like this, you know, this guy's just talking about something that he imagined, but you know what you, if God is real, then call on him so he can reveal himself. And if your heart is open to that, you're going to see God come in and he can prove himself. And my encouragement to you is to reach out to the Lord. Chobi, could you just pray for anyone who may be watching your testimony right now or even dealing with some of the things that you may have dealt with in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Lord, well, I just pray right now, Lord God, whoever's watching, I pray, Father God, that if they have questions or struggles, that you just really intervene, Lord. You do what only you can do. You heal, Lord God, things that even doctors say is impossible. Lord, you are able to turn situations, Lord, of death into complete life. So I pray, Father God, for everyone who's tuned into this, Lord, that, that they will leave this, Lord, with a different understanding of you, Lord, that your intervention would take place, Lord God, and bring transformation. Lord, anyone who's struggling in gangs, Lord, that they feel like there's no way out, show them, Father God, your authority. Show them what you can do. Give them the boldness, Father God, that's beyond their own. Or those who need mental healing, Father God, Lord, you are able to touch every, every nerve ending, Father God, every part of the brain, Lord, and open it up, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.